Welcome to this episode of the Hosting Heaven podcast. My guest today is Jan Mitchell. Jan is based in the USA. Jan had a life-changing experience with the Lord in her early days at university. As many of you would know, this is a very interesting and sensitive season in our time where we are meeting new people, connecting uh, with new communities, and we're trying to find a sense of belonging, um, a sense of worth in our environment, and we're learning who we are outside of our families. Jan stepped into the university space and she encountered an amazing experience with the Lord. Today I have Jan with us and I believe that a story is going to be a story for many of redemption, a story of God's unconditional protection and a story where many of us will see that God's love truly is unconditional and unchanging. Jan shares his story with us today. Jan, welcome to the House of Hosting oh. Heaven. How are you feeling today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much and excited to be here. How are you? I am doing amazing. And it's such a great opportunity to be able to just hear and to glean from you interesting salvation story that I believe is going to be a testimony to many people that truly uh, the Lord is yearning to encounter us. So tell me a little bit about your childhood before we step into this university scene where you encounter the Lord. Yes, yes. So I was raised in a two-parent home, um, had five siblings. I'm the fourth of the five. I'm actually a twin. And um, so it's uh, three girls and two boys. So I have an older brother, younger brother, older sister, and then of course me and my twin. And we've lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, all of our lives here in the U.S. And growing up, you know, we were raised in a traditional uh, Pentecostal home. And I shouldn't say traditional um, because there was a time of salvation for my dad. Um, he did not believe in the faith. He didn't believe in Christ and neither did my paternal side of the family. Um, and actually, my mother is the first generation salvation uh, that we're aware of in our household. So she was the first one that God used um, to be a blessing and to save her so that she could save her household. And so we, um, under my mom's guidance and my dad's uh, leadership as well, too, she took us to church. Uh, we were there Sunday, seemed like all day long. Um, we were there on, on Tuesday nights for Bible study, Friday night for Friday night service. So we had a lot of church upbringing. Uh, my mom is an evangelist, so she was always known as a prayer warrior, um, in the church. So she did a lot of things that when she would do things, um, speaking, going out to see this homeless and the sick and shut in, she took us along with her. So we learned service at a young age uh, to other believers in Christ, but that didn't necessarily mean that I had my own relationship with Christ. That's right. And I think that's the story for a lot of us that uh, we get to share in our parents' faith while we're still at home. Um, we get to be covered under their prayers, um, under their covering. But the moment you step into a new space where you have to find your own identity, um, you actually realize that this is a journey that you have to take on your own. So now you've arrived on campus. What kind of lifestyle are you living? Oh my gosh, one of freedom. <laughs> one that was a rebellious teenager ready to be, you know, away from parents. And I shouldn't say rebellious. When I think of rebellious, a lot of times we think the hardcore, the runaways. No, I was subtly rebellious. Um, I was quiet. Um, I was sneaky. Um, I love being on campus alone. It was where I had my first body piercing. I uh, got my chin pierced and my eyebrow pierced while I was in school and, you know, just really just kind of absorbing. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, trying trying to find my place, trying to find my identity. And uh, going on to the fraternity parties, the sorority parties, did a lot of partying um, in school. And I was that person who would uh, wait to the last minute to cram. So I would cram for studies and still make an A. And my sister, to this day, she's like, you make me sick. <laughs> you know, because I could do that. 
But I remember yeah. one specific um, time that actually leads before the, um, well, I won't go too far into that because that kind of goes in part of the story, but there was an encounter before the encounter um, that I had um, to let me know that God, even though I was doing what I wanted to do or felt like I was big enough to do, that God still had his hand on me. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So um, are you at the same university with your twin at this point? I am. I am. And and are you are you feeling like you're holding each other accountable? Uh, or both of you are trying to find yourselves and you are more than happy to give each other the freedom to? Yes, probably that latter half. So we were both, um, we didn't know a lot about accountability. We knew a little bit. Um, my sister was probably a little bit more accountable than I was. Um, but she, you know, but we both kind of allowed each other the freedom and the space to grow into who we would eventually become. Now, we, before we actually get into the day um, that you have this beautiful encounter with the Lord, I'm actually now curious to find out this pre-encounter uh, story that happens. Take us through that because I'm sure a lot of our viewers are, are now very curious to find out. <laughs> yes. So my pre-encounter story actually happened. So remember I said I was doing a lot of partying. Um, and during one of those party episodes, I became pregnant um, as a young woman, um, unwed. I was um, 18, 19 years old and um, still going to college. And I remember one night um, I went to bed. My Actually, I was four months pregnant at the time. And I had a dream there at the dorm. Um, in the dream, I saw myself, my twin sister, my older sister, and then one of our cousins from California. We were all in a vehicle. And we were traveling to a fraternity party. And I remember we were driving on the highway and we were singing, you know, we were dancing. We stopped at the dorm, which was actually prophetic because God was letting me know then we were actually going to pick up my twin sister from the dorm, which in a dream I should have been picked up as well. But that was the Lord foretelling me that I would soon be leaving college um, when I had my daughter. Um, and and I didn't catch that till years later, but we were driving. We picked up my sister. I remember the dorm being full of young women. They were partying. They were all getting ready for this big party. And so we picked up my sister. We ended up driving and then we're on the highway. And all of a sudden it's pitch black at night. It's, it's, it's as dark as it can be. And all of a sudden I see the sun start shining on the right side of the car. And, I, and that made me, because I was sitting in the back seat on the passenger side. So I looked up and I said, well, what time is it? And on the clock, it was 3.33 a.m. And so, and I said, well, Lord, I said it to myself, I said, why is the sun shining at 3.33 a.m.? That doesn't make sense. So when I had the courage to look out, I turned towards the window. And when I looked out the window, I saw these clouds that were ginormous and the clouds begin to scroll back like a piece of paper. They just begin to pull back. And in the midst of the clouds, there was these fine little strings. It looks like a lighted um, yarn because it was light, but they were all different colors of the rainbow. And at each end of the light spectrum, there was an angel there and the angel was in standstill and nothing on them was moving but their wings. And I'm, you know, of course I'm scared to death. So I'm telling my sister, I'm like, wait a minute, do you all see this? Nobody in the car in the dream could see it but me. And I'm telling them, I said, don't you see these angels? Look at this. And and here was my mindset at the time because I'm still young. I still think I have time. So I said, well, you know, and, and I looked up and I saw two moons in the sky. Uh, one was a full moon, one was a crescent moon. And I said, you know, I said, well, I think I read somewhere in the Bible that, you know, if there's three moons, then I, you know, then that would be the second coming. So I still have time. I thought I still had time. So I begin to look at the um, moon again and be behind a second moon, a third moon begin to appear. And I begin to, I jumped into the uh, back end of the car, the back seat of the car, and I begin to cry out to God to save me. Um, because in that moment, 
the glory of God beca- began to come through the cloud so strong that I could literally feel my soul lifting out of my body. Wow. And I knew then that I was going to die and that I was not right with God. And I began to cry and I began to pray and ask God for mercy. But it was like my prayers were hitting the ceiling of the car and coming back. It was such a great feeling of desolation and fear. And again, nobody else in the car in the dream experienced this but me. And I remember at the time the Lord was getting ready to come through the clouds. I mean, it was a light greater than you could ever see in your life and, and could stand. And again, the pool was so heavy that I could feel myself leaving here on this natural earth. But just at that time, that's when I woke up. And and when I woke up, you know, I looked around me to make sure I was safe. I was in tears. And those who know me personally know that I'm not a crybaby. I'm not a person who easily cries. But that morning, I began to cry and I called my mom. I, you know, called her at four o'clock in the morning and I was crying. I couldn't even get the story out telling her about this dream. And she was very calm. She's like, well, Jan, that's just the Lord letting you know that you still have time and that you can get it right with him. And so I'll say I got saved for 24 hours. <laughs> out like of, many of us. Mm-hmm. Yes, for 24 hours. And then I went right back into the same thing. And Where I'll is stop. the fear of the Lord that you encounter and you experience in those 24 hours go after 24 hours? Because I'm sure you're not, you're not the only one that's ever had these sort of encounters. And, and at some point it wears off the, the fear, mm-hmm. the reverence, um, the conviction. Mm-hmm. I think just being not being consumed with the right people, not surrounding myself. You know, a lot of times when you're in college campuses and you're by yourself, and you've got so many other people who are about the party life, you don't really see a large core of Christians there. And if they are there, they're hard to find. And so I think I got sucked back in into the norm of having a boyfriend, of having the friends that I knew, having my sister, and leaning into those things really kind of pulled me away um, from really digging into God. And I also believe it's the timing of God. I also think the timing, because sometimes God, again, when my mom advised, she said, is God showing you had, you still have time. And that meant he was, he still knew I had to go through a process and there was more I still had to learn before I would really come and consecrate my life to him. And I am grateful for that mercy that he showed. And and I love that you mentioned that because I credit quite a lot of my spiritual growth at university to a student um, Christian community. And I think that for any student that is watching who is currently at tertiary and you're just trying to get your life and your relationship right with God, I would highly encourage you to plug into a community that continues to fan into flames what God is trying to do in the inside of you. And so um, I I love that you touched on that. So take me to the morning of the day that you have this encounter with the Lord in between this first encounter and the second encounter. Do you feel like you were sort of drawing closer to God or it it catches you completely unaware. The morning of the encounter, um, was there anything peculiar about that day? It was. I had actually um, had started um, working by this time, working a full-time job and I worked in the evenings. So I worked the the graveyard shift um, from three o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the day, um, or excuse me, a little bit actually 10 o'clock at night till around five that morning. And, and you're during, still at university? Um, I am not. At that time, I had um, left the university. I had moved back home uh, with my parents and I was attempting university locally, um, but I was kind of taking classes hit and miss there because now I'm, I'm a new mother. I've had my uh, daughter and and so life shifted for me. And, um, and so I was home and I was working um, trying to go to school part time, trying to work, trying to raise a child, and um, and that particular morning, I had heard that weekend that there were so many great things going on, um, 
for our church. They were having a soul winners conference and they were having a 5 a.m. prayer. Now, God had already started grooming me. I didn't know that's what he was doing, but he began to take away my desire for certain things slowly at a time. Um, I was, you know, he was taking away my desire for partying. I didn't feel like partying anymore. I felt more mature. I felt like being, a, I wanted to be, you know, fully um, play, uh, active in my daughter's life. You know, I really want to buckle down and settle down. And, um, and during that time, I figured, you know, my taste even in music had changed. I li originally had listened to R&B and rap music, believe it or not. And my taste began to change. I began to prefer the older slow jams, more classic sounds, more classical music. My, my, sh my taste shifted. And, um, and I began to read self-help books and, um, and one morning I was reading this book uh, by a lady who's not even a uh, believer. She's a Yoruba priestess. Um, and she began to talk about prayer and I didn't agree with what she was teaching because I knew my upbringing and what we were taught as Christians. And, but the prayer is the one that got me. So I said, well, you know, they're having a 5 a.m. prayer. Let's go to prayer. And which was unusual for me because I'm not getting up at 5 a.m. hardly for anything. Um, and so I press my way to that 5 a.m. prayer and just being in the presence of the praying women uh, that were there, they begin to pray. Um, and, and I begin to join in prayer, didn't really know how to pray at that time, just kind of following along with what they were saying. There was a word of inspiration shared before they began praying. Um, and we had a lady who was facilitating the uh, prayer meeting and she just began to, you know, pray and she began to prophesy different things to the people. Um, and she began to say, thank God for a new car, thank God for a new house, et cetera. And then I, um, you know, felt like she was talking to me um, I, and not so much about the material things, but other things she began to prophesy. And so I began to pray before God. And so they asked me to come to the altar. Um, I went up front to the altar. Actually, we were all at, up front at the altar praying. And, and they could see that my prayers had turned into seeking, really seeking God. So the women begin to surround me um, in a um, tradition that we don't do much anymore, which is called Tyrian. And they began to celebrate and, you know, the Lord with me and they were encouraging me to keep calling on in the name of Jesus, to keep telling the Lord, yes, um, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And for they, somebody who, sorry, for somebody that doesn't know what tarrying looks like, what does that entail? Yes, yeah, so tarrying is where uh, when you make your confession of Christ, they would have you come up to the altar and ask you to seek the Lord. It would be openly before uh, people. And while you're there praying, God, you have people beside you encouraging you what to say. Um, like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. They just have you keep repeating it or yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because a lot of times we don't know what to say, you know, when you're first coming into the faith, even though you may have been raised in it, like I was, you still, yeah. you know, may not know what to say in that moment. And so those people come, they begin to work beside you and encourage you in your faith. And, you know, and they celebrate with you, which is uh, really amazing when they see you getting ready to break through, you know, they get excited with you and they're you know, encouraging you and telling you, keep calling on Jesus, keep your mind on Jesus. So they help take away those distractions um, that come even mentally uh, when you're seeking God, of course, because the enemy's always there. And he yeah. did me the same. Yeah. I had the distractions there about, oh, this person is looking at you. Oh, they see your chin ring. They see your eyebrow piercing, your nose is running, all this stuff, you know, that would normally cause me to be insecure. So the, um, those people are there to help you to stay focused and help you to uh, press through into God's presence. And that is very, 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 very powerful. And for me, the fascinating part about your encounter uh, that you're about to have is that your hunger for prayer came while you were reading a book from a Yoruba priestess. Yes. It's great <laughs> how God is able to pull things closest to us. Um, and pull us from wherever we're at and use whatever we have mm -hmm. to draw us closer to himself. Yes. Yes. It was amazing. Um, 
yeah, it was it's, it was definitely amazing because I would have never thought, you know, because normally we think, OK, I'm going to find God reading the Bible or I'm going to find and you will. Um, mm-hmm. But my first encounter, like you said, was through reading a self-help book and mm-hmm. all the lady kept mentioning through there is prayer and the importance of how prayer helped her. Now, there, of course, were other things. Again, I didn't agree with what she said, but God didn't need all of that. He just needed me to hear about prayer. And he knew the upbringing I had brought into um, that I had been raised in, that I knew there was only one Lord and one Savior. And so he just kept illuminating that for me, pray. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try it out. You know, I was called myself being a big girl. I'll, I'll try prayer. You know, I'll, I'll pray in the morning, see how that works. And oh boy, did it work. <laughs> so. Amazing. So uh, you are surrounded by these women that they are helping you, Terry. Um, they are allowing you and supporting you as you press into the Lord. Tell us what happens next. As I'm pressing into God, I'm getting all these distractions. Like I mentioned from the from the enemy himself, he's telling me about you know this that your nose, your you know all these things to throw me off guard. And a lot of times, again, as I was mentioning, we never none of us have seen Jesus face to face and live to tell it. Um, but in this particular encounter, you know, they were telling me, well, keep, keep your mind on Jesus. So the only picture I had in my mind was this picture I had saw at the church that they kept set up. So that's who I saw Jesus as in my mind in that moment. And so, you know, I'm saying, yes, Lord, but somehow while I was tearing and praising him and saying yes to him, I was surrendering to him and that, yes, my, um, the Holy Ghost imagination began to kick in because then I saw myself, I saw myself at one end of the earth. And then there was this great big staircase between me and heaven. 